Hallo? 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 Oh, warte, holst du das? Ah ja, hallo. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, dear colleagues, and also all the people who are following online. My name is Luc Tarwe, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here on this lecture on behalf of the China platform. In fact, this uh, China Lecture Cafe series uh, was launched in uh, 2012 and the idea is to provide a platform to our professors uh, to put the spotlight on certain aspects and accomplishments in the framework of their cooperation with their partners in uh, China. And we have uh, many well-known experts in different fields of uh, different fields of our university, let's say. Well, um, we have these uh, presentations by our colleagues uh, in this series, but uh, we also sometimes invite people from uh, outside the university to uh, give a view on some specific aspects related to business in China. So, um, we have for this series in this edition in 2022, we have scheduled uh, four lectures. Uh, we had already before two lectures, very interesting lectures, also very enlightening. And uh, today we welcome uh, Professor Sven Biskop, and he will give uh, the third lecture in this series with, uh, let's say, the challenging title, China, the Great Powers and the War in Ukraine still the Middle Kingdom. Let me briefly introduce uh, Professor Sven Biskop. He obtained his master's degree in political sciences and also his PhD degree at Kent University, where today he is a professor lecturing on the grand strategy of the European Union and the other great powers, and uh, also on Belgian foreign and defense policy. And in addition, he is the director of the Europe in the World program at the Egmont Royal Institute for International Relations in Brussels, the think tank associated with the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Sven is also an associate member of the Royal Academy for Overseas Sciences of Belgium and an honorary fellow of the European Security and Defense College uh, which is an EU agency where he lectures for diplomats, military, and officials from all EU member states. He is also a regular speaker at the Royal Military uh, Academy in Brussels and also at the People's uh, University of China in Beijing, where he is a senior research fellow. His latest book is entitled Grand Strategy in 10 Words, a guide to great power politics in the 21st century. I don't think these books are available here, but in all bookshops, of course, it's one of the top selling items. Um, Sven has been honored with the cross of officer of the Order of the Crown in the Kingdom of Belgium, of the Kingdom of Belgium and the Grand Decoration of Honor of the Republic of Austria. Before I uh, hand over to Sven. I just want to draw your attention to the fourth lecture uh, for this year, and this will be presented by our colleague uh, Bartesen from the Sinology Department, and he will be speaking about confusion, Confucianism. So, um, that's the introduction. Sven, the floor. Thank you, uh, Luc, and um, good um, afternoon, yes, by now, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Indeed, the good news is that nobody needs to worry. No books will be offered for sale, so nobody needs to feel obliged to. No, no, you know that it exists now, and that's, uh, that's already, already good. Um, I uh, 
I do not claim to be a China expert. Let me say that up, up front. I think uh, China experts have to speak Chinese uh, to start with, which I, uh, which I do not. But I've been traveling to, to China uh, every year. Well, first time 2003, and then every year since 2006 to teach at uh, People's University or Renmin University in Beijing. Till COVID, of course, interrupted that as well. Now I teach online, and I hope that uh, I can go back uh, next year, we will we will see if that is uh, possible. Uh, in my private life, I also made a sort of switch to, to Asia since I married a man from Taiwan. Uh, still, I didn't learn Chinese, which I have to hear sometimes at home. Why did I have to learn French? You learn French to become a citizen of Belgium. Uh, and are you not struggling uh, to learn to learn Chinese? I have no answer to it except to say that I'm busy. And of course, I'm also only busy because I make myself busy because I'm an academic. We create our own, we create our own uh, uh, workload. Um, but that has, it helps me, right? Because um, that gives me, via my husband, access to, um, to, to Chinese sources. He follows the social media, he follows the news, also in Japan. He speaks fluent Japanese. So I didn't marry him because I needed a research assistant, but um, it, it's, a it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice bonus, uh, so to say. So to say. So, just to situate it. So my, my take on China is always the European Union and what should be, I try to think about what is the place of the EU in the world and how do we position ourselves vis-a-vis -vis China, Russia and the US in the first place, the other great players, great powers if you want, and, and, and on. So what I want to do to, today is to, to take a look at China's role in the, Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, what that means for global politics and what that means for the future of our strategy. So, to start with, imagine that China would have said, we support Ukraine to the same extent that the US and the EU support, uh, we support Russia, sorry, to the same extent that the US and the EU support Ukraine. That, I think, would have been a tipping point for world politics. If that would have happened, then we would now be in a new global Cold War we and the Americans against the Russians and the Chinese. You would again see a world that would be torn apart into two blocks that would stop cooperating and that would gradually decouple from each other. This would not be in our European interest, clearly not. Um, you see how much uh, economic cost it causes to partially decouple from Russia. And I think, as you all know, the Chinese economy is even more interwoven with our economy, so we could do that if we wanted to, but it would be enormously costly. So uh, I would say we should only consider this if, if it's as a really a last, a last resort. If we would have, again, two blocks who no longer cooperate, we can forget about an effective climate policy. Not that I think we have such an effective climate policy now, but at least we pretend. The, if you have a new Cold War, we would even give up the pretense. Uh, Two new blocks, it wouldn't stop there then with Russia and China against the US and, and us. The, the next step is that each block would try to entice or coerce every other state on the planet to choose sides. So you would trigger an instant geopolitical um, uh, competition. And finally, in a world of two blocks, yeah, who would be the leading voice in our block? It would not be Brussels. It would clearly be Washington. So we would once again be reduced to a secondary role in the secondary theater also. Because the Cold War was in the end about Europe, a new potential Cold War will mainly play out in Asia. So we have nothing to gain from a new Cold War as Europeans. The good news is we're not there yet. The risk exists and continues to exist because of Sino-American uh, rivalry. And if that escalates, the chance is very large that we are sucked into it, whether we want to or not. But we're not, we're not there yet because in the end, China decided not to support the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Rhetorically, they have stayed very close to, to Russia to this day. It's only very recently that, that China began to take a little bit of distance. I think partially simply because they don't want to be associated with failure. Uh, and also because the more radical Russia becomes, notably the nuclear threat, the less China uh, likes that. that. That is clear. So rhetorically, they're still very close. But in spite of all that rhetoric of support, the actual policy has been more non-intervention. The, they're definitely not dropping Russia, but they're also not really doing something extra to support them. It's basically non-intervention. Um, 
non-intervention because, on the one hand, they have very strong interests in common in Russia. I mean, seen from Beijing and Moscow, the world order is still dominated by the United States, and they perceive a very strong interest in supporting each other against the United States. And that's a very strong overriding interest. On the other hand, however, I think China's grand strategy is mostly based on a political economic approach, and that requires a degree of stability. If you want to roll out the Belt and Road Initiative, you can't do that in a country at war. And interestingly, Ukraine was precisely a key country for the Belt and Road Initiative in Europe. And of course, that is now interrupted. It was interrupted the first time in 2014. It's now interrupted even to a much larger degree in, uh, in 2022. So that's also where the Chinese interests clash. And I think this translates very often in, I always quote a Russian scholar, Dmitry uh, Trenin, who says, uh, China and Russia uh, never against each other, but not always with each other. They will never openly drop the Russians, but it doesn't mean that they will always actively uh, actively support them. How much the Chinese knew in advance about this war, we will likely never know in, in any detail. Uh, we know that Putin went to visit Xi uh, be just before the invasion at the Winter Games in Beijing, and they published this grand declaration of everlasting uh, friendship. Now, if you read that statement now, you can read it as a programmatic uh, statement, and you can read it as China condoning the war. But if you read that statement and try to pretend that you don't know that the war happened, it actually leads as a condemnation of military interventionism. Of course, they mean our Western military interventionism, but I also have a hunch that afterwards when they signed this grand declaration against military interventionism, and then two weeks later Russia does exactly that, I also think that probably in Beijing some people were not entirely amused. There are indications, and, and uh, we studied that together with, with uh, two colleagues, uh, Bart Sen and, and Jasper Rock, who's present here from our Sonology department, so actually can read the sources. And our conclusion was that there are strong indications that Putin probably warned China that there would be a special operation understood as a relatively limited operation that would be over very fast. Uh, but he did not uh, warn him that he was launching a full-scale invasion, that the Chinese were surprised and one thing that they do not like is surprises, given their, uh, their long-term uh, long focus. Um, China obviously does not follow it in, in applying sanctions against uh, Russia, that's clear. Uh, not alone in that, it's, you know, it's only about a third of the countries in the world that apply sanctions against Russia, the rest don't. Um, but the Chinese companies who are active here in countries that have a sanctions regime, of course, have to apply that. Plus, even though there is no official sanctions regime in China, quite a few big Chinese economic players have suspended big projects in Russia because they are uncertain of the outcome and they think it's better not to take too much risk. So all of this is, in a way, for us, good news. There were people in the beginning of the conflict who tried to push China to go further. First of all, maybe you remember, there were quite a few voices in the beginning, mostly but not only from the Anglo-Saxon world, that tried to say China is supporting Russia. And at one point, people were saying they are delivering arms to Russia. The evidence was never quite clear. And I, well, I always thought, I really hope it's not true, because I think it would be a real strategic mistake on the part of China. Uh, but in the end, it does turn out, to the best of our knowledge, not, not to have happened. Some people said, oh, we should push China to also apply sanctions against Russia. And if they don't want to, we have to apply sanctions against China. That, I think, would have never worked. Because, again, the overriding interest of supporting Russia is too strong for them. And they know very well, in the end, we cannot afford to also begin a costly economic war against China while we just launched one against Russia. Luckily, we didn't go there. And as I said, uh, in my view, the position that China has taken is probably the best we could have hoped for. So that is the... That is the good news. Now, if you look at more broadly world politics, what does that, what does that mean then? Uh, it means that, that there is still a lot of marge de manoeuvre, a lot of flexibility uh, in this world. We're not yet in a world of two blocks. We have different players. Some players are more closely linked to each other than others. We with the US, uh, China with Russia. But in the end, every player will prioritize the national interest. So it gives you more options. Uh, to, to play the game of, of international diplomacy. Um, it's a complex game, though, right? And you see other players also. Uh, I mean, you could say that quite a few people expected China to support Russia. 
Uh, but the other, it also play out the other way. Quite a few people, for example, expected India to to align with us in this war, but they didn't. Basically, China has shown uh, India has shown more active support of, of Russia in this war than China. They have increased energy exports, have not stopped their arms exports, and they refuse to condemn uh, condemn the invasion. And so that goes against our intuition because we think, oh, that's a democracy, that's a partner. They must, of necessity, align align with us. And so the world is complex, that gives us options, but you can only use those options if you play it smartly. And I'm not sure that we're always doing that because the inclination is to apply a very simple frame to this complex world and to say you have democracies and you have autocracies, they are against each other, and that's the dynamic that drives world politics. I think that's very simplistic, and to me it's so obviously not true. I mean. For example, Ursula von der Leyen, the Commission President, this was the, the narrative of her State of the Union speech to the European Parliament in September. As she is reading it out, several other political leaders are visiting uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, Algeria, Azerbaijan, all model democracies to buy the energy there that we no longer want to buy from, from Russia. So it is so obviously not true that all autocracies are against us, nor is it true that all democracies always support us. But this sort of frame is there. It's, it's, we know this from the Cold War. There are good guys and there are bad guys. We, we also have this, I think, still very idealistic notion from the 90s when we thought uh, the period of the end of history, American unilateralism, that the whole world was going to adopt our model. And so it's sort of ingrained in our, in our thinking to look at the world in this way. But I think it's really counterproductive. I mean, think about it. Um, of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a grievous breach of the UN Charter. Um, but So why would we say in advance that every UN member that is not a democracy, we think that they agree with this breach? Because two-thirds or so of UN members are not democracies. Why would we push them preventively in the Russian camp? A very few are in the Russian camp, very explicitly, but just a handful. A very few are in our camp, and most say they just want to stay out of this. So I really think we ought to drop this frame of democracy versus autocracy and adopt a more, um, a more nuanced view. This means that you have to accept that every state has a right to be in the game, in the game of international politics. Uh, if you agree that the aim should be, in the end, to find a modus vivendi in which all states can thrive, pursuing their legitimate interests in legitimate ways, then you have to accept, first of all, that every state has the right to be a player. You cannot find a modus vivendi, you cannot find a balance of power if you deny the right uh, of the other to, to exist almost. And this is, I think, what sometimes the American strategy boils down to, boils down to, let's make China small again. And that's not going to happen, of course. China is big, right? Um, it's not likely to implode anytime soon. So if you say our end state is that China must be a small player again, you know you're set on a course of confrontation. Um, so I think the, the starting one must be you must accept that every state has legitimate interests and the right to pursue those interests in legitimate ways. This means to start with that you must therefore carefully distinguish between different types of actions. Um, states pursue their interests they do so in legitimate ways and in illegitimate ways, and you cannot react in the same manner to that, right? Um, a lot of what China does, we do too. A lot of what China does is not per se illegal. I think recently, um, China bought almost 25% Costco, the company, of the port of Hamburg. There's nothing illegal with that, right? So you can say that's a big China, uh, Chinese success. You cannot criticize them for it. You can criticize the Germans for selling it, right? But you can't say this is China's fault. I mean, if I were them, I would, do, I would probably do the same. Um, so it's legal, it's legitimate. It doesn't mean it's welcome, right? If we don't like it, we can say, well, let's in the future make it illegal. You could adopt legislation that says critical infrastructure. You make a list, you include ports, and you say are not allowed to be sold to non-EU players, no Chinese, no Russians, no Americans. But as long as it's legal, yeah, then you cannot react to it by, by criticizing China just because they are successful, right? So we don't have to be happy because they are successful, but if we think they're, they, are, they have outplayed us, then we must simply play a better game ourselves. 
Of course, if they pursue their interest by breaking the rules of the game, then you're in a different scenario. Then we can point it out, we can push back, or if necessary, we can retaliate. But you must continue to make the distinction. That is my point. You cannot regard every normal act of economic competition as a hostile act of rivalry, because then you're on a slippery slope that leads you towards um, confrontation. It also means that, in a way, seen from an international politics perspective, the fact that China is an autocracy is irrelevant or, or close to irrelevant. Yeah, because, of course, it, it has become even more of an autocracy recently. I think all the observers were surprised that at the CCP Congress recently, she basically um, pulled all power towards him. And there's, I think, not a single person now in any of the central bodies of the party that is not somehow a client of Xi. So domestically, he has ensured absolute power. I mean, I, mean, I, I never make any predictions. I long learned not to do that. But it's unlikely that this is the foreboding of, a, of reducing internal repression. But it is also not necessarily the foreboding of a more aggressive foreign policy, right? Again, this is in our, in our simplistic frame. We equate dictatorship with aggressive foreign policy. But historically speaking, this is not the case. You have many authoritarian states that had a very balanced or almost timid uh, foreign policy. Think, if you want, of the Spain of Franco. Franco came to power through a very bloody civil war. He installed a very severe domestic repression. In his foreign policy, he made no move. He very smartly kept Spain out of the uh, Second World War, uh, sought to align with the Americans, and basically, in, in the Cold War, he sort of shifted to our side, right? And we happily supported every dictator as long as we said, oh, but he's not a communist dictator, so at least he's, he's our dictator. So it's not because China has become even more autocratic recently that ipso facto we can expect a more aggressive foreign policy. It's a possibility, so I'm certainly not ruling it out, but it's not a given. So again, I would I say we have to be careful and maintain our nuanced approach. It does mean, and that I think is what sits uneasily with us, that yeah, um, we have to accept China is an autocracy, that there is little we, we can do about it. So I think in our policy, we must distinguish, therefore, between the domestic policies of other states and their foreign policies. Domestic policies of other states can be utterly reprehensible, and I do think we must criticize that. We have the legitimacy to do that. I mean, China has signed all the human rights treaties. If they violate it, therefore, other parties to the same treaties have the right to point it out, to publicly criticize them. But we also have to know our leverage to force them to change their domestic policies is very limited. Um, so there's no point in, in, therefore, in adopting sanction after sanction because of it, because you know you're wasting your ammunition. It will not, it will not work, right? Um, whatever we do or we don't do, short of declaring war, China will not change its policy on the Uyghurs and Xinjiang. It will not change its policy on, 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 on Hong Kong. Uh, so I think it is an also an issue of strategic realism, of realpolitik, if you want, that you accept that if you have a right, and you could argue if you want a moral duty to criticize it, uh, but you have very little leverage to change it. So I would say keep your powder dry and reserve your effective instruments for when China crosses our lines in their foreign policy, a way that directly affect our interests, which they have done, for example, by de facto annexating the South China Sea in a very smart way, not like Russia through a full-blown invasion, but without firing a shot, building military bases on islands and artificial uh, islands. They have de facto annexated the South China Sea, very cleverly played. And they've created a fait accompli that will be very difficult to undo short of going to war. Nevertheless, we cannot recognize it, must support the other literal states, and so there we have to push back. Um, think also of all kinds of hybrid actions that China and others uh, takes against us. Um, some of them, of course, legal, as I said, gaining economic influence by buying up uh, some of our companies and infrastructure. If we don't want it, it's up to us, we can change it. Uh, but, um, but also all kinds of influence operations, cyber operations, espionage, hacking, sabotage, and so on and so forth, then, of course, we must push back and, if necessary, um, retaliate. Again, it sits uneasily because I think we have grown up in this idea of um, we are a union of democratic states as EU, and it is our purpose to democratize the world. 
and to say I do not disagree as such in principle, but you have to know the limitations and we just cannot do that in, in practice and I think we have to uh, sadly uh, accept that. Um, and we have to accept that our interests force us to cooperate with autocratic states like China simply because there are not enough democratic states, right? If you say you can only trade with other democratic states, I wish you good luck. Uh, there simply are not so many of them. Uh, so you must draw the red line closer to you. I would say the red line is, is, is not that you can only cooperate with other states that share the same values. I would say you can cooperate with everybody as long as in doing so, you yourself do not do anything that violates your values. So you can trade with China, of course. Can you import um, products that are made by Uyghur slave labor? No, because then you become complicit in their human rights violations. So uh, that is sort of, obviously there is a gray zone here. I'm not saying this is always very simple in practice, but as an overall guiding principle, I think, uh, I think it could work. Third and um, final point, what does that uh, mean then for our strategy? How should we, um, how should we behave in the, in, in the future uh, towards China and even more, more globally? I want to mention three, three uh, avenues of, of action. Um, one, uh, open uh, strategic autonomy. That's the EU, the EU term. It basically means we have to keep global free trade going or we have to keep globalization going if you want because that's in our economic interest. To, in order to maintain our prosperity, we have absolutely no interest in everybody closing their economies and becoming ever more protectionist. If it's on the EU interest, it's definitely also not in the Belgian interest. We're an export economy. Two thirds of our GDP comes from uh, export. But if you want to do that, uh, you have to take necessarily some uh, protective measures, not protectionist measures, but protective. Number one, you have to decide uh, which sectors of the economy and which sect which part of your infrastructure are so critical to your economic sovereignty and thus also to your political sovereignty that you want to maintain control over them. And so you say, I don't sell them to anybody else that is from outside, uh, from outside the EU. Um, number two, you have to decide which economic sectors are so critical that you want to have not just your own expertise and technology, but your own production capacity. Eh? That can vary from uh, medical masks, which suddenly we discovered during the pandemic we don't produce anymore, to semiconductors and chips, uh, and, uh, uh, and so on and so on and so forth. If people would say we have lost that, we have not lost anything. Nobody has taken that from us. We have voluntarily abandoned all that production capacity because it was cheaper to produce outside uh, Europe, right? So we haven't lost anything. We have abandoned it. And this is what happens. You let the market play without control by the state. The market always goes wild, inevitably. And so now the state must invest, subsidize, to recreate the production capacity that the market voluntarily abandons. And thirdly, and I think that's the most difficult to create strategic autonomy, reciprocity. Can you find a way to force China to open their economy to us to the same extent as we open ours to them? This is really tricky. And, it, and you may remember that uh, at the end of 2020, was it, that we negotiated the, the comprehensive agreement on investment between the EU and China. It was announced agreement in principle. Then a few weeks later, we adopted the EU human rights sanctions against China because of their treatment of the Uyghurs. And then China totally overreacted, put sanctions on a host of uh, members of the European Parliament, national members of Parliament, academics, foundations, and so on. Uh, and so now we're stuck. Uh, because in a way, it, it's double. Um, I think China, by overreacting, has made it impossible for us to continue to compartmentalize between the human rights issue and the economic issue, which is what I advocate that we should do. And in fact, they then push people on our side to link it all together. Uh, and so it is now very difficult because of, I think, on our side, people really know why we took those sanctions. What was the objective precisely? It seems to be the instinct now something happens Sanctions, symbolic sanctions, an individual there, individual there, right? Think also of the demonstrations uh, in Iran, the bloody repression of that. Oh, sanctions on Iran, uh, Mr. A, B, C, and D, we freeze their assets and so on. Does that change anything in Iran? No, absolutely nothing. So you can say, look, we have acted. And it's a bit the same with these symbolic sanctions against China. What is actually the impact is to send a message. Um, but could we not send that message in another way 
without at the same time damaging our other interests? That's my big question. So, it, but this is now very difficult to undo. So in this economic sphere, it means if you look at the recent visit of Chancellor Schultz to, to China, for which he was heavily criticized, I think as such, he's not wrong. We're not going to decouple economically from China if we can avoid it. Uh, so it's not wrong to go and to go with a big economic delegation. But I think that the timing and the, and the manner was wrong. You know? This rush to be the first, I think, was not necessary. I would say after the CCP Congress, let them come to us. Let China explain to us, new Congress, we will have new leaders. Well, the, you know, the, the biggest leader will be the same one, of course, new prime minister and so on. What will be our policy? It's up to them to explain that to us, not to, up to us to rush to there and to say, oh, please, we are still here. Um, also, this rush to be the first of the Europeans, right, refusing Macron's objective to go, uh, offer to go together, um, as if we don't know yet that if you want to hold your own against China, you don't have to negotiate every member state separately, but as EU, it is so obvious, and then still we do it. And then, of course, coinciding with selling a quarter of the port of Hamburg, so ag exactly going against my idea that you need some protective measures before you open up to China. So as such, he's not wrong, I think, but the way he did it, I think, played into the cards of those who are in favor of decoupling from China. Um, we will see how this evolves. Second point, the global gateway. I don't know if anybody in the room has heard of the global gateway. Um, it's supposedly our answer to the Belt and Road Initiative. It was announced um, last year in the State of the Union by von der Leyen and has now been announced again which probably means that if you have to announce it twice, not that much has happened with it. Uh, and actually, it goes back already to 2018, when we adopted an, what was then called the EU Asia Connectivity Strategy, which was then rebaptized, but nothing happened with that. So we rebaptized re Global Gateway and increased the scope. So it's now really global, not just aimed at Asia. But I think the basic idea is good. You can say it's a kind of open door policy. You may know the original open door policy was US policy to protect China in a way. At the end of the 19th and the early 20th century, when all the great powers were carving out their extraterritorial zones, their concessions in China, even Belgium, we had a concession in, in Tianjin, and we were the first to return it in the 30s. Uh, I'm not sure why. I, my guess is someone in the foreign ministry said, this is what this costs, it's way too expensive. Uh, let's give it back and, and, and score a few points. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, then the Americans said, no, we should end this, we should have an open door policy and, and allow China to, to deal equally with all of the great powers so that we don't need to have this race among the great powers to carve out these zones of um, influence. Let us just um, have an open door policy. In a way, we now have to do the same, but then to defend ourselves from China this time. And so we should be able to go to countries in, in Latin America, Africa and Asia and say, look, we're not asking you to kick China out. I mean, we're not going to kick China out. Uh, so it would be rather hypocritical. But we're suggesting you just to be smart and to diversify. Don't put all of your eggs in the Chinese basket, because maybe one day then you wake up and you realize I'm not actually fully in control anymore. So here's a European basket. Put some of your eggs in our basket. And here are our investment projects. But of course, then the money must be there. And that's our problem. There we are handicapped. I mean, China, the government can obviously order a company to invest in another uh, country, whether they want to or not. Yeah, in our case, the Belgian government cannot order a company to invest where it doesn't want to. So we have to mobilize public money for that, or at least give public guarantees. We should be careful not to overload this. If you say this is the global gateway, before you can join, you must become as democratic as Switzerland. It's not going to work, right? We are catching up to China. Um, so don't overload this, but you can do a lot. If you do projects, you can create technical standards, um, uh, labor standards, ecological standards, transparency standards, and so on, so that our projects hopefully have a sort of um, exemplary uh, effect, uh, which I think would be, uh, would be a good idea. Um, so I think the global gateway this open should be our open door policy for the 21st century to avoid again that the great powers begin to carve up the world in spheres of influence. Um, and you see that on all sides, the Chinese do it, the Americans do it too. The Biden administration just released its national security strategy at the end of October. There's a lot of talk about multilateralism, but not multilateralism as we understand it. I think if we hear multilateralism, we think of the big United Nations organizations, the Security Council, the specialized body, 
that the Americans and what Biden understands by multilateralism is the, the, um, the U.S. own initiatives. Uh, their, the, the Quad, you know, their, their frame with uh, India, Australia, and Japan, or AUKUS, their alliance with Australia and the UK, they say that's multilateralism. And then what they have now called uh, the PGII, the, the, uh, the Partnership for Global Investment and Infrastructure. So it's their global gateway, so to say. But yeah, if every one of the great powers invests only in, in their own outreach initiatives to other countries and not in the universal multilateral institutions, we still risk upending in this race to uh, bind countries exclusively to you and in a world that will be divided in spheres of influence. And so th this is therefore my third and last point. I also think it is still up to the EU to invest in the big multilateral institutions. Nobody else of the great powers is principally committed to multilateralism. We are the only one. So if we don't further that agenda, nobody else, I think, is, is positioned to take the lead. Um, I, a lot of people say, yes, but China is a revisionist power. They're trying to overturn the system and to create a, a parallel world order or their own world order. Frankly, I don't see that. I don't see that yet. I mean, there are some elements of that. Yes, they have their own organizations. There's the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. There's the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. But the influence is very limited. Uh, and anyway, I mean, it is not forbidden to create the SCO. We have created NATO, right? It's also an exclusive club. They have created their exclusive club. In the end, the SCO matters little or nothing. The center of gravity is with the BRI. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is actually interesting because it's a truly multilateral bank, and we are also members of it. So I don't see China until now trying to undo the, the multilateral institutions and create their own. What I see is rather than them trying to gain more power within the existing system, which again, as such, is not illegitimate, right? That's the game, right? We often complain, oh, the Chinese again managed to get some uh, person elected into a senior post in some UN body. Well, yeah, if they elected the, the Chinese, it means that diplomacy was probably better. You say, yeah, but they see at all the money they rolled out. But that's what we also do, right? If a, if a Western European country is a candidate to be a temporary member of the Security Council, what do you do? You travel around Africa and, and you open embassies where you don't have them and you, you hand out development aid and investments projects so they would vote for you. Later afterwards, you can close down those embassies again. That's the game that all of us play. It's again an example of, yeah, don't criticize China because they play the game. Criticize them when they break the rules. But if they play by the rules and they're better than us, it means we must improve, improve our game. So I still think don't, don't forget about the multilateral institutions um, too, too quickly. We must invest in that. It is much more in our interest that China is in the system than undermining it from the outside. And of course, they will only stay in the system if they have their rightful say in the system. So that we must accept, right? You can say the UN system and the, the Bretton Woods and so on was all created by us, Americans and Europeans, in 44, 45, at the end of the war. It does not make it less legitimate because everybody else afterwards signed up voluntarily. But it's clear that if today we want to reform the multilateral system, or we want to write new rules for new policy fields, such as climate, okay, yeah, we're not quickly going to settle the rules between Brussels and Washington anymore. We have to bring in, at the very least, Beijing, otherwise it will not work. But then, that's the challenge. It only makes sense to bring in Beijing if afterwards they abide by the rules, right? So you have to give them a say with the point of keeping them in and having them play by the rules. If you don't play by the rules, then there's also no point in compromising, right? So it's a very difficult tipping point on, on both sides, right? There may be a temptation at some point on the Chinese side to leave the system, do their own thing. They feel they cannot have enough influence on the current system. At the same time, we cannot keep them in at any price. Um, that, again, is another uh, challenge. So I guess my message is, like professors always say, it's complicated, uh, it's nuanced, um, but I would say that's exactly the role that the European Union should play in international politics, to continue to see the nuances, right? The debate has shifted, also in Brussels, there's more polarization, especially about China, and that's not good. You know, we're not at war with China, also not in a Cold War with China, not yet at least. So there's no point in dividing the world in the panda huggers and the dragon slayers, right? I think it's exactly our, our role to
to, to continue to see the nuances, to work with China when they offer, give us something to work with, to push back against China when they go uh, when, when they go too far. Obviously, a lot of what I say will also depend on China's own future strategy, right? And we have to see how this how this evolves now that Xi has given himself yeah a lot of power. And, and uh, but again, let's not jump to conclusions, and let's try as an ideal end state to find a, a, a modus vivendi in which all of us can pursue our interests and cooperate to salvage uh, what remains of the planet. Thank you for your attention, and I will gladly listen to your questions, comments, ideas on these topics. Thank you, Sven, for this very uh, interesting uh, brief. It was on a very timely matter and topic to your first question. So, the floor is open for questions. Some things don't. You know, I was just teaching this before coming here. That's the same. If I ask questions there, they're also they're also quiet. Except that more people sit in the front rows. That that's the only difference. Please, Mark. Please. <laughs> Indeed, um, the ecological problems, everybody is motivated in it, the uh, populations. Uh, economically, multinationals, uh, all the powers temporarily do well, but they see with the weather differences. China knows what typhoons is, and know that uh, if the agriculture doesn't work, uh, if the country doesn't work, so they have to they do an enormous effort for fundamental signs in plants. And here we, we forget about it, but uh, we automatically with good universities, we, we have good, but every year we have to look up and they have better results. So it's pretty, pretty close that uh, they will make bad soils, better soils with with fungi and bacteria because they do the gene engineering. They have no declared Hainan Island zone for working with GMOs and, uh, and CRISPRs. So Hainan Island is one and 1.3 times Belgian, I think. So that's a, quite a field uh, to do it. Uh, Bill Gates works there together with them. Uh, so for Europe, it's very time that we, we should see uh, what can be done because China is in front of India with the same population, uh, of course, economically uh, and, and at the level of fundamental science uh, and, and working capacity, uh, but they have the, the human capacity and, and everybody uh, understands that rationalism alone doesn't solve the human problems. And it's recent, but we didn't touch that very much. So how the, the states was the first one to, to, to talk about emotional intelligence and, they could, and could translate it in dollars, and the major companies have a, a service on, on emotional. So that was touching some points only uh, where could we uh, at least accelerate the, the, the situations the, that we are not to being as strong, but at least know that places where we are weak, prepare that we are strong already now. Uh, that could help because we still should talk about Africa and South America, how they handle their... Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. I'm not going to try to answer that. You're the expert on, on all of these issues, but I think that, yeah, the general point I take that um, there's several dimensions. You also, you often find a sort of alarmist tone in our debate that when China has made an advance and is sometimes further advanced than us, it's automatically seen as a threat, right? If we advance or the Americans advance, it's for the good of mankind and, and, and humankind and so on. So there I think we must indeed be a bit, a bit careful and probably also accept that we will not be the leader anymore in, in every field. But certainly uh, I think choose our fields well in which we want to want to excel and, and then position ourselves to to cooperate where, where, where we can. I guess as a general principle, this could, this could hold. 
well, I see this trend also in many other fields. And when you compare 10 years ago to 15 years ago, where they were at the research level, let's say in engineering and science, I've visited many labs uh, all over in, in China. And now, yes, the difference is the system, I think, and just the political system. Because, and also like a research day, choose universities that get a lot of money just to be at the top, have the best equipment worldwide. Like um, I've seen an example a couple of years ago in 3D printing, additive manufacturing in Sichuan uh, University. We have a joint lab with that with uh, Ludwig Cardon. Uh, Ludwig is already working on that for many years. He has a very good research group. But there at the campus of Sichuan University, they were building uh, they had a building now under construction of 14 floors or something just for 3D printing. We cannot do that investment. In no other European country we can do that investment. So my, my principle is just try to cooperate with them, also in my field of uh, structural engineering. And so they have huge lab, they have huge projects, tunnels, long span bridges, and so on tall buildings. We don't have this anymore in Europe, and so we lose this expertise. And for me personally, it's a unique experience to be able to cooperate with them. But OK, I think uh, I'm afraid this is not easy to solve just due to the political system. And there, when something is decided, everybody has to follow. Here in Belgium, once you decide something, everybody starts to discuss, and that's the whole difference. Yes, please. Uh, okay, so in an attempt to return to grand strategy, um, I wanted to ask Professor Biskop, so you've outlined how our strategy isn't always as rational as we might ourselves believe it to be, even perception-wise, about like the, um, how autocracies and democracies, we, we perceive it as to be like diametrically opposed in all ways, which isn't true, so that's an irrational view of ours. But then you present, in many ways, the Chinese calculus as being entirely rational, whereas, for instance, when it comes to Taiwan, they might, they might irrationally invest their resources into recapturing the island. And I guess, for like a pointed question, do you feel we should exploit this irrationalism by maybe getting them to, like, by being, by proposing concessions on our stance towards Taiwan and giving up, like, guaranteeing Taiwanese sover sovereignty? We don't, well, we kind of do unofficially. Give up on that and get them to concede, like, more material interests of ours. Interesting one. Um, I'm very dutiful uh, person in the audience should take my course and anyway, so it's really uh, uh, self-imposed hardship the, this time. The, uh, I want to say one more word about the previous issue, if I may, which is that in, my, in our field, political science, of course, the, the difficulty is that uh, there, because it's ipso facto political, and then if you don't have the, um, the freedom of speech, there I think it is very difficult for our Chinese colleagues in my sort of field to to advance because you cannot have the debate like you have in the exact sciences. And that eventually, I think, will be uh, will be a handicap. I mean, to make it very concrete, uh, I once was supervisor of a very good Chinese uh, PhD student uh, who secured a book contract to publish his dissertation uh, in English and in the end decided not to do it because it's too sensitive and I will get into trouble. I mean, that's a shame if you have good results and they cannot be disseminated because of that. So. I think that's specific to, to, to our sort of field, that issue. It's a really good good question. I mean, one, you're right. Uh, the, the, I, I think overall, Chinese grand strategy is relatively rational from their, starting from their target, which is the CCP must stay in power, and then we think it through. But the irrational elements are there, and it's indeed the, the consolidation of national territory as defined by the CCP, which of course clashes with our definition of it. Certainly the South China Sea, which is a totally spurious claim. And Taiwan, a tricky one, almost everybody accepts that it's part of China, but we behave as if it isn't in practice, right? Um, 
should we make concessions on that um, to 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 demine that issue? I think the difficulty there is that also on our side, um, uh, we feel very, I think, attached intuitively because Taiwan is a democratic uh, government, uh, and that makes it really difficult to to go back to go back on that. Huh? I mean, if if Taiwan were an authoritarian state, also, I think we in Europe would care a lot less about it. Of course, the Americans do not care about it only because it's a democracy. For the, the Americans, it's part of their defense military posture uh, in, 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 in the Pacific. And in, it, it's part of their sort of uh, the first island chain, as it is called, that basically um, allows them to remain the dominant military power in the Pacific. So for them, even if Taiwan were still an autocracy, as it was until the 90s, they would probably still support. I think for us, for the Europeans, that probably the main thing is that Taiwan is democratic. And I find it very difficult because I do find, I, I, I think it is very difficult to democratize, to engineer democratization from the outside. I think we better give up trying. But where there is a democracy, I do feel that somehow I perceive a moral duty to defend that democracy. Even though you could argue from the grand strategic point of view, maybe it's in our interest to let it go but not just like that, but in return for something, right? You could argue, objectively speaking, 1.3 billion people, 23 million people, they already speak Chinese, um, you know, what, would, it, would, it, would it change? But because they are a democracy, I don't think we can, we can, just, uh, we can just drop them. Uh, I think the best, therefore, we can hope for is the status quo, right? Uh, is the status quo. I mean, it works perfectly well for everybody. That's a silly thing. There is no need to change it, objectively speaking. It's also very much in the Chinese interest, but it's an ideological issue. It's a symbolical issue. And there, I agree with you, there's an element of uh, irrationality. The only thing I can say that I will predict the future is that there will be no Chinese invasion of Taiwan before the 10th of January, because we will be on Christmas holiday there. And uh, after that, I'm not sure, but not before the 10th of January, because we'll be there. No, not, uh, <laughs> not really. Please. Uh, about Taiwan. Uh, saying irrationality is not, a, that's not a problem. Things, things, a lot of uh, ir irrational things are co completely true as human behavior, but we will not talk about that uh, and prove it. But uh, for Taiwan, uh, do you think it's only the problem of this irrationality? Economically, uh, the, the chips, it's Korea and Taiwan. We all need it. Uh, you think it, you can discard it? It's, it's too weak for, for, as a force? It's a very good point, Mara, but my feeling is that because the economic interaction between China and Taiwan is so close, I mean, basically, uh, now there's COVID, of course, but before there was free travel back and forth. A lot of what we think is made in Taiwan is actually now made in China and then assembled in Taiwan. So, yeah, that's true, but does China need to conquer Taiwan to have to benefit from that? So, I, I Give it away. Oh, yeah, do we give it away? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is it an extra reason for us not to not to give it up? Okay, so I want to say, I think China for economic reasons, it works well. I, I do think in Chinese eyes, after the ideological instruments plays also the strategic military uh, consideration to break the first island chain on the American side. I think on our side, what, what we see rather is the opposite, that we're sort of um, uh, creating a plan B that in case we lose Taiwan, so to say, that we have our own capacity. And so basically we are forcing the Taiwanese to invest in the US and in Europe to build the chips and semiconductors here. So in a way, you could say that's for the, mo in a way you can say it's good for Taiwan, but it's also not good for Taiwan because it means it makes it easier for us to say, well, okay, uh, we lost them, very sad, uh, national day of mourning, but we still have our chips factory here. That's a tricky one. Um, uh, why is um, China neutral in, in uh, Ukraine? 
is not because of Taiwan, because of the policy of non-interference in the domestic affairs in other countries. They say, for instance, that, okay, Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, Taiwan, United States, European Union should not be interfering in that. Now, if they would support all our, uh, uh, Russia, then they would actually uh, uh, tell them that that's interfering in the domestic affairs of other countries. And that would tell the United States and the European Union and anywhere else that we can interfere in Taiwan. We can support Taiwan independence. I, yeah, I can see your point. But, but of course, in the Taiwanese, um, yeah, no, I can see that, that point. But I think anyway, um, they, the, the Chinese are also from a different starting, uh, starting position. Non-interference, yes, and I think that that's one reason why uh, they would be hesitant to, um, to condone even Russian interference by their close partners, so to say, because I agree, then you never know who will be the next one, and it puts you in a tricky, uh, in a, in a tricky position. Um, is it an implicit message to us, to the vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan? Possibly. At the same time, we send an implicit message because our economic sanctions against Russia also means an implicit message to them, sort of economic deterrence. If you would try to change the status quo on Taiwan by use of force, we could do we could do the same to you. So I think it works. Um, I think it works both both ways. But I think for the for me, what I think is a very big part of the motivation is that China will never allow Russia to determine its relations with us and with the Americans. So if they are too closely aligned to Russia on this, they damage their relations with us. So I, I think in the Chinese mind, they separate us. Yes, they have their partnership with Russia, and rhetorically they support it. But for them, it doesn't mean that, therefore, they must be opposed to us on everything. And so I think they will be very careful to make sure that, that what the Russians do will not have a direct impact, or certainly not on their relations with the United States. I think in the end, there's always the most important relationship for, for, for China is the relationship with, with the US. I have another question, I think I'll ask it. Already to you at another occasion, what about India in this whole picture? You, you mentioned a couple of times or once India, but how do we have to see it, not just today, but, but in the future? Because the population will uh, be next year, I think, will overtake China. Yeah, indeed. But I think, yeah, I, I do think we have a problem in, in the EU and in Brussels of lack of capacity on India, I think. I mean, everybody is working on China now, so to say. But, you know, what's our expertise on, on India? I think there's an issue there, and I certainly have very little knowledge. I was supposed to go for the first time to New Delhi in March 2020, so I didn't go. Um, so there's an issue there. But I think also India itself is by far not so active in, in, in outreach. I mean, if you look at the scene in Brussels, there's a, a Japan chair, there's a Korea chair. Uh, Everybody is very active, but India is doing very little. So it, somehow it seems to work with both, both ways. Because you could argue that part of this, what to say, the, the space for marge de manoeuvre to have is that you know India is an interesting one, uh, interesting player that the EU maybe could could think of as a potential partner for some of our diplomatic um, initiatives, because um, India, I think, on the one hand, has its border disputes with China, uh, uh, and of course China has a close partnership with Pakistan, and the Indians have their dispute with Pakistan. Uh, the Indians are also in the quad with U.S. On the same time, they will never want to be in a sort of military alliance with U.S. They stay firmly non-aligned. And I think that makes it a potential interesting partner for an EU that would try to play a more, let's say, overall mediating role. But in my course, I, I argue that uh, to be a great power, you need to have the resources. I think India could have those. But you need to be able to mobilize those resources. You need to be well enough organized domestically Otherwise, you cannot put to use the resources there. I think India is, is far behind. And you need to have the ambition, of course, to be a global player. I don't see that in India. I think India is a regional player and, and, and folks still, not exclusively, but close to on, on its conflict or dispute with, uh, with Pakistan. So 
but it's definitely uh, I try to always push uh, students to write uh, and their dissertations <laughs> uh, on it because I think it, it deserves more deepening I think what what is the potential of India and also our potential partnership with India No, no, like that, I, I can't say. No, no, I couldn't say exactly. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. We had uh, actually an event this year, uh, Egmont, with the um, Academy of Overseas Sciences on, on India, because 75 years of independence this year of, of uh, India. 75 years of Egmont Institute, which was less consequential for world politics, but uh, my answer. If you want some information, maybe this could be shared. This is the first GMO, so who you have to ask to help you with the book, or the open. Just allow you to connect there. So who knew it? May the first thing from the world, because as we done for India, we just the need to, uh, to have a better Mm -hmm. Yes, um, first of all, yeah, I can indeed not stress enough uh, how right that comment is about India. And uh, in our department, we see every year like one or two new students of Indology, which is, of course, not enough at all. And there's no expertise at all in India. Um, what I wanted to make is first a little comp a comment and then a question. Um, on the interesting Belgian concession in Tianjin, it's actually a very interesting part of history that's been completely forgotten. Uh, actually, originally it was sold to uh, Russia and then Belgium stated, uh, like, ah, we will develop uh, it much better if you give us a little part of the, the, the concession to us, which the Qing dynasty then did, but then it became a complete failure. No factories were ever built. And by the 1920s, they decided to give it back, as China would indeed pay the debt that they had accumulated on the grounds. <laughs> and then they made it a gesture of friendship, indeed, like, oh, look at us being the colonial. But, uh, yeah, that's not how it worked, of course. But indeed, they were the first to give it back. But it's a very interesting uh, little chapter. But by the end, by the 1920s, there were only the only Belgian presence that was left in, on the concession grounds was like eight soldiers and a village. And that was uh, <laughs> all that was left. But what I wanted to ask was actually about uh, Central Asia, um, which is actually, uh, yeah, of course, now in the Ukrainian war, a very interesting playing ground. Um, and um, for example, to, to look at a statement by the, uh, the Kazakh uh, um, president uh, Tokayev recently on, on that he wanted to, um, that he saw, and I think he posted it in some Western media in an op-ed, that he wanted to basically, um, the future was half of Europe, half of China. He didn't mention Russia, and he wanted to 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 to, to find a, a, yeah some some ground in the middle on the, as part of the Silk Road. I found it very striking, and I was wondering what you see as the implications of the yeah Ukraine war and the Russia's broken security umbrella for yeah, Central Asia. Thanks, Jasper. Yeah, to, to continue with the historical anecdotes, me first it's also a bit forgotten that. Leopold II, who, as you know, wanted a colony, uh, not so much for Belgium as for himself, um, that the, uh, Congo was basically his, his last choice, and he tried just about everybody, everywhere else first. And at some point, he also asked the emperor of China if he would not sell Taiwan to Belgium, uh, which the emperor refused. Uh, and then tell, um, tell my husband, such a wasted uh, opportunity, you could have been born Belgium. But, uh, exactly, yeah, we'll all be there. Yeah? Uh, we would be in the midst of, yeah, yeah. but you know, and since he knows a bit of the history, also the Belgian Congo, he sees it more as a lucky escape for Taiwan, and he's probably not entirely wrong. Uh, anyway, it's a really interesting point, Jasper, and, and you, you saw also this flare-up of violence between Armenia and Azerbaijan again, even though Putin had supposedly just mediated an agreement. Uh, you saw a flare-up, which for me was totally unexpected, between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. It didn't go very far, but clearly the perception is Russia is no longer uh, uh, has as much. No, Russia no longer has a, as much capacity as before to be the security guarantor in the former Soviet space. Um, I think we'll have to see whether this continue, whether really Russian power power is eroded to such a great extent. But if it is, then you see, yeah, all, all the parts begin to move because the Russians no longer do that. 
will China step in, right? I think China really benefits from the from Russia doing it because they don't have to get their hands dirty, they don't antagonize everybody. Russians keep things stable, as in Kazakhstan, and then the Chinese roll out the BRI uh, from a Chinese point of view, Russia. So, will they be forced to do it themselves? Maybe will they like it? You could ask. Will they get a test for it? Uh, interesting question. Will somebody else try to step in? Uh, in Central Asia, I find it difficult to see somebody else doing it. Caucasus is maybe different. I mean, we do try to play a role there. There's also Georgia, which technically is a candidate for NATO membership and so on. So uh, the, there's, there's Turkey, which is a, an interesting NATO member. Um, so all kinds of moving, uh, moving parts there. Um, or if Russian power, Russian power erodes even more, it's, it's one scenario that, that basically uh, the central government would lose control also over the periphery of Russia itself. And, and then what happens, especially in the Russian Far East and Chinese influence there. So you have all kinds of potential scenarios. I would say to me, for the moment, the most likely scenario is still that in Russia itself, an authoritarian regime will stay in power. And even if it's not Putin, it will be another authoritarian leader. But the former Soviet Union, yeah, I can see it really, uh, really shift. And I have the feeling that in the EU that we're not really thinking about these scenarios. You know? we, we are against the war, obviously. We have our sanctions. We support Ukraine. But are we reflecting already about the post-war scenario? What's our ideal end state? And what can we do to bring it about? I'm not sure I see that. Seven or eight years ago in Kazakhstan, I'd never been there. I was very much impressed by the potential of the country and also the strategic location. It's very strategic and all the other stands around, but these are smaller ones. But in area, uh, Kazakhstan is the ninth uh, country in the world. So that's very big. And, uh, when you look at China, uh, yeah, the States and so on. You, but it's very strategically located also. And you, I, I, could see the mountains there. They said, yes, behind the mountains is China, and, and so on. And many resources. Yeah. So, yeah, I, uh, I still remember that someone said to me, in Kazakhstan, you can find all the elements of the table of Mendeleev. They have really everything. They have oil, gas, and, and so on. So it's potentially a, a very rich country. All right, if there are no more takers, or you, yeah, yes, you. Yes, I just uh, would like to <laughs> refer to the statement by your VUB colleague, Jonathan Holzlach, about all the Costco ships that these are potential war vessels. Yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the meeting of the Belgian uh, China Chamber of Commerce in Zeebrugge, and also the Chinese ambassador was there. And in his speech, he referred to that claim. <laughs> well, you have to be a bit careful there. I mean, it's a little terminology. I mean, uh, a warship and, 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 and slagship is, is, a, is an armed Navy vessel, right? That's something else. And obviously, not every container ship. I mean, I think it would be very hard put to convert a container ship into, into a war into a warship. So that's one thing too. Yeah, but but that, uh, I mean, to me it is, uh, I would say, yeah, of course, if if there were ever a new great power war, so it's basically a war for survival, every power mobilizes uh, the entire economy and the entire society, right? So what did the UK do when, when World War II started? Basically, they mobilized the entire commercial fleet and the government takes control of the commercial fleet. That's what you do when, when, when you're in a war for national survival. So I would say, yeah, I, 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 I didn't find it necessarily so, um, so particularly shocking in a way. Uh, but we are not, uh, not at war. Yeah. And yeah, you could say. It's a special atmosphere that is created. And I guess yes. it, it, it would not happen exactly like that. But the whole atmosphere. Yeah, that's true. And again, I mean, I think it works both ways. So I think we, again, certainly the Europeans, must try to continue to find the nuance here. 
It doesn't mean uh, not, I'd say, it doesn't mean looking away from, from what is negative about China. We also fully acknowledge that. And if necessary, when it's aimed against us, push back and, and retaliate. But keeping the nuance, of course, we have seen in, in many recent cases of, of, of China's far too assertive behavior, which I would argue is massively counterproductive. I think Chinese diplomacy missed a lot of chances. If I were China, I mean, during the whole full years that Trump was in power in the US, it would have been so easy, in a way, to drive a wedge between Europeans and Americans. Well, I think that the idea in China is, oh, the, the Europeans don't count. They just follow the money. Uh, whatever we do or say, it's not entirely wrong. We do often just follow the money. But I mean, they really missed a chance there to reach out. And, and instead, we got this spat with this overreaction against our human rights sanctions. Uh, we have the whole thing of wolf for diplomacy. As you also had a Chinese ambassador to Belgium having the temerity to demand that the foreign minister retract an interview. I mean, you don't do that as a master. I think you don't demand the foreign minister of the host country to retract an interview. So I think that China itself is often too assertive, I think, for its own interests, uh, even. So it has to work uh, both ways. Really, the feeling, I think, I also have some contact sometimes with the uh, Chinese ambassador in Brussels and also his counselors. I have the impression they don't really see the, the problem to, to some extent. But uh, well, coming back to the, the statement I just made there, I had lunch before coming here with some colleagues after PhD defense, I told them, yeah, it's a very interesting lecture I'm going to, and so on. And then uh, one of the colleagues referred to, ah, she had been attending a lecture by Jonathan Holslach, and now that was very enlightening, and now she knew the truth and so on, and so on. And then I said, yes, but did you ever listen to Sven Biskop? Oh, no. But see, the, the, the story that, and that's a very popular story, and, and that's the only thing you see in newspapers. And well, I find this uh, not a little bit tricky, but uh, yeah, strange. Let's Uh, no, no, I, I know, but four years ago he was in the army to become uh, an officer or whatever with another another person. I don't know, I don't remember the name. So maybe he was influenced by the army to see in vessels, in normal vessels, uh, battle, battlefield vessels, yes, that's my opinion. So sometimes, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, okay. I'm the opposite. I'm too young. We had already suspended uh, conscription. Uh, yes, yes. Well, look, um, I, I mean, uh, Jonathan and others became a reserve uh, officer, and there's a push by the armed forces to uh, to um, create more interest in the reserve, which I think is a good thing because the armed forces need uh, reservists in, in, in many areas. Uh, I did not feel the call, because my view is, as a professor of political science, I mean, I'm anyway paid by the government, so, and I'm anyway in touch all the time with, with, with the armed forces, so if they need, want my advice on something, it's there. They don't need to recruit me first. To, as a reservist, they can ask us like that, and it will be, it'll be for free. So I, I think, I mean, look, um, it, of course, nuance sells less uh, nuance is more difficultly than than spectacular announcements so that that is that is clear but i do not think that at the same time uh, you and i have known each other for a long time and i think we can have a very nuanced debate and we often often have in, in, in very different different formats but of course the public debate the public sphere is is another thing and there the sort of spectacular announcement so uh, sells better. Let's say I would not play it that way, but that's a matter of uh, choice. Um, so I think it's interesting that, like, this conversation was about how our conception of China influences our grand strategy, whereas I think oftentimes we interpret Chinese grand strategy as coming from like a conception-free zone where they just see us as we see ourselves. And I, I think, for instance, maybe we underestimate 
the level to which Chinese officials see our system as being unstable and like uh, especially the United States being on the point of implosion, which is something you often see in like, well, I don't speak Chinese either, but like in translated documents where they, they truly a lot of opinion makers in China believe the United States is bound to implode as a great power by itself without them even having to do anything. And that might explain their view as to like, oh, Europe will have no choice but to pick us as the great power because the United States will disappear by itself. And I, I don't really have a question. I'm just saying maybe conception of the other, we just assume they can conceptualize us as we conceptualize ourselves, which is something you point to as well when you're saying like, oh, our demo we democratize the world from their point of view is a very different thing. Sorry. It's a really, it's a really good good point. Sometimes I wonder, I think Jasper is the one who can judge that better. Is, is part of that just how to say that's their own public sphere. It's sort of a, a very conscious attempt to influence their own public opinion. Do the decision makers really believe that or they hold that or not? I don't I don't know. It does strike me that sometimes there's still a lack of understanding also simply of how our system works. Eh? For example, antagonizing the European Parliament is a really bad idea. But there seems to be no full understanding that this is a fully autonomous player, the European Parliament. You can have all 27 governments of the EU member states on your side, but still the European Parliament can do what it wants. And so it's totally, and, and once you have antagonized them, to turn that around is extremely difficult. And so there seems to be this, this idea that, yeah, yeah, they're independent. But, but surely you can, no, we cannot force them to anything. They're European Parliament. They do what they, they, do what they want. So I think that that also still, still seems, to, seems to play. Sven, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation you've given. Also, your viewpoints on all the big, well, not all the big, but some big problems in the world. And uh, I think, yes, this story will continue. We can also, I think, easily invite you next year to, to give a follow-up and so on and so on. And we're very glad that you are really in a position that you know very well what's happening, uh, yes, in this grant policy worldwide, I think. So um, let's give him a warm uh, round of applause. <clears throat>